Hey guys, it's Lion here with Hobbies of Man once again, and today we're going to be doing another review for uh, an anime, or actually a TV show that happens to look like anime in this case, and that would be Skull Island, it's a new Netflix series, the first animated project in the MonsterVerse, I think it's what it's called, by Legendary, and um, it's about King Kong, ultimately it is about King Kong, but it mostly focuses on these human characters, um, which I didn't really dislike, but I didn't really love either. I think there was a very interesting episode here, but the problem was that that episode had this element to it that it really put me off of it. And if I were to rewatch it with no voice acting, I would have really enjoyed it. But because of the voice acting, it kind of damaged my enjoyment of that episode, even though it's probably the best one of the season. So yeah, um, Skull Island is created, helmed by this guy called Brian Duffield or Duffield or do field i'm a duffled I, I i don't know how to say his name i just said it four times and it was two, two different pronunciations i don't know it was animated with powerhouse animation which apparently is from here in, in in texas they're from austin and they've done a lot of work for netflix and they are more or less an anime studio that is based in the u.s and they work on a lot of things that ultimately look like anime even if they're not technically anime due to the fact that you know they're not from japan but uh, ultimately, I think that that kind of distinction, it is slowly uh, becoming less and less relevant and less and less meaningful because, you know, things like Avatar um, and things like uh, Legend of Korra and, you know, uh, the, the Thundercats series. Honestly, the original Thundercats and most of the 80s cartoons were made by Japanese studios, even though they were American cartoons. So maybe we can say that anime and cartoons have always been the same thing. Technically they are the same medium, but there is a distinction to them due to the fact that uh, the content and the ways that the content comes about are different. But, um, you know, we do kind of try to make those differences, but ultimately I do think that those differences are falling away, specifically for these kind of action oriented type shows, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that Powerhouse Animation is from Austin, but they do kind of this like anime style. Um, there's this person called JP that was attached to this, uh, Legendary Television, of course, and this other guy called Jacob Robinson uh, functions as the last major part of this story um, and uh, one of the producers as well. So yeah, the music here is done by two people. First is Joseph Trapanese uh, and Jason Lazarus. Uh, this uh, series released sometime last month, I don't remember when, but I watched it on the 18th of July and it's not bad, it's not amazing, it's a very middle of the road American anime and I didn't dislike it. I enjoyed the time that I spent with it, uh, which is only about two or three hours. There's only eight episodes. Each episode is about 20 minutes. Remove all the credits and stuff and it ends up being like 18 minutes per episode. So that's what, um, an hour, like two hours and 30 minutes. So it's shorter than watching uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning and that's, not that long of a movie at least that movie doesn't feel that long even though it is like three hours long so yeah i spent like two hours two and a half hours uh watching this and i enjoyed myself while doing so i didn't really love it by the end but i didn't hate it i had a good time with it so yeah um the basic premise is this school island exists it's connected to the hollow earth which is this old theory um that then became kind of this sci-fi fantasy type of uh trope um and it's it's very common in things like jules verne's uh journey to the center of the earth there's this uh old thing called the lost world uh by the guy that did sherlock holmes uh and then there's some uh hidden world slash hollow earth kind of things done by edgar rice burroughs uh called the pellucidar series and you know there's other things tarzan goes to the center of the earth at some point in the original edgar rice burroughs novels and then he does it in the uh in the Disney show eventually, I think, or there was a movie or like a long episode that did that, I don't remember. But, you know, even Ice Age has gone to the Hollow Earth. So uh, it's a thing that kind of recurs, right? And in this case, it recurs in uh, in King Kong's lore as well. And I think even the 1930s movie for King Kong had this Hollow Earth theory thing in it. I um, mean, I think that's because at that time that theory was still kind of popular and it was still relevant to the sci-fi that was happening at the time so yeah i think it's a fun kind of thing it's pretty unrealistic but it's enjoyable and i think it's nice to kind of in, in, kind of bring it over to to more audiences uh every few years so that we don't really forget this kind of fun sci-fi trope so i like that so 
Yeah, and it's got this insane flora and fauna. This island that they're in, Skull Island, has this insane flora and fauna. I think they're supposed to be prehistoric, but none of them are actually prehistoric. They're more just like amalgamations of animals. Like there's this turtle that's half turtle, half plant. And then there's these chameleons that are like big giant predators. And then there's this like thing that looks like a Muto from the Godzilla movies. Um, and you know, a bunch of crazy things. There's also this Kraken that looks kind of like Malamar and Tentacruel had a baby. Uh, those are two different uh, squid Pokemon or tentacled Pokemon. So yeah. Um, and uh, Kong is the owner of this island. And there's this kind of mixed human settlement um, that exists somehow, but it's not really explained. And eventually later on, uh, these people end up marooned there. And so uh, these people end up marooned there because uh, of varying circumstances, but basically there's this girl called Annie and she and her father ended up crashing onto an island that's very near Skull Island. Her father eventually died and left her alone. While she was on this island growing up, she found this giant rock dog, bulldog thing that reminds me a lot of Bernie or BK. Uh, they're the same character. They have different names for, for weird reasons from the I Am Number 4 movie or from the I Am Number 4 book series. If you guys remember that stuff, you know, shout out to you guys that happened to be fans of that back in the early 2010s. Um, and she and this dog become friends and they grow together. And eventually she gets to the age of about 16. And one day people arrive on our island and uh, they attack her and her dog. And it turns out that the people here are a mercenary team led by her mother who's trying to find her daughter after uh, some new information came to light. Basically, they found coordinates to this island uh, or a way to find this island because it doesn't show up on maps and stuff uh, and doesn't show up on radar. And so this mom takes a, a mercenary group to find her daughter. Turns out her daughter turned out to be a cave girl of some sort. And so there's conflict there. Um, and then Annie wants to escape from this custody because no one actually explains to her, hey, I'm your mother, I lost you when you were a kid, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here to find you now, and I'm sorry that we had this conflict that we didn't need to have until the very end of the kind of series, right? But uh, that does eventually get resolved. But before that happens, Annie um, escapes from her mother's clutches and then ends up on this other boat manned by Cap Charlie, who was Cap's son, Mike, who's Charlie's best friend, and uh, Cap's friend, who happens to be Mike's dad, who's this Japanese guy. I honestly don't think he ever got a name because he died in the first episode or two. And uh, both of these ships get attacked by this giant kraken that I mentioned earlier. And so everyone ends up marooned on Skull Island. And so that's basically the first two episodes. Eventually, the next four episodes are basically island survival time with you know two different groups happening here. The adult group, Cap, uh, and uh, Irene, who's uh, Annie's mother, and the mercenaries. And then on the other side, we have Mike, Charlie, um, Annie, and her dog, who's just called Dog. He could have had a name. I really wish he had a name because he's actually a very cute, kind of crazy monster. I would like to have a name for him, right? But um, we kind of have these two groups surviving differently, and eventually they converge. And now it's time to make a big plan to escape. And so before we can do that, we actually have to have an episode of Backstory where we learn about Kong uh, and this human friend that he had who doesn't get a name, sadly. Her name is literally just Island Girl. She is this uh, gorgeous redhead chick. Kind of reminds me of how Korra is dressed early on in the Legend of Korra anime or show, um, but she speaks Spanish. And this is the seventh episode. This is the episode that I said was wonderful except for the fact that there was voice acting. Because this chick speaks Spanish, the whole episode, but she never sounds natural. Um, there's this kind of very specific thing that happens to Latin Americans that move to the US that don't really learn Spanish um, the same way that other Latin Americans learn Spanish. They don't necessarily speak broken Spanish, um, although a lot of them do, especially later on. Um, but a lot of second generations um, kind of kids have this thing where they don't sound like they speak Spanish, even though they can pronounce the words perfectly. Um, I think I feel like I deal with this kind of problem sometimes, but ultimately uh, when I go to Mexico, most people kind of understand that I'm from there as well. Like I still have like a, a Mexican sounding accent, um, but this, this voice actors that they chose, apparently it's the voice actors for 
Loba in Apex Legends. I don't know anything about the game. I know that that character exists and I know that she's super hot, but I don't know anything about the voice actress. I don't know if she's actually Hispanic or not. Her name sounds very American or very like generic European. Her name is like Frida Wolf or something. Um, and she spoke Spanish throughout this whole uh, episode and it never felt natural. It always felt like it was just English dialogue directly translated to Spanish and not forced into a natural cadence. Like it felt very robotic the way she was speaking. Um, it also felt oddly formal. And I guess yeah, technically Kong is the guardian deity of this island, but it feels very unnatural the way she spoke to him. Uh, kind of oddly formal, but also not formal in the correct way, if that makes sense. Um, and so the whole time I was very like audibly like or visibly cringing while I was watching this episode, even though it was actually the best episode in the season. Um, because it gave you so much connection to Kong. It gave you this wonderful, beautiful looking character that had a very interesting kind of dynamic with this guy, you know, with Kong, with the giant ape. Um, and also she had a very nice personality, a very fun personality. It's just that the the dialogue and the way that the dialogue was delivered just sucked. And it made me really upset. And I, I even had to ask my sister, hey, does this sound bad to you or is it just me? And she said, no, it sounds bad. Um, it sounds pretty cringy. And um, I just, I really appreciate the effort of having, you know, a whole episode for an American audience in Spanish and, you know, just forcing them to read subtitles. I, I, I really appreciate that aspect, like the, the inclusivity or the, the kind of like multinational vibe of this of series, uh, because it really is like very clearly like, hey, all of these people are from all different places. And that means that some of them are going to speak a different language. But... If you're gonna do that, maybe make it sound more natural. Maybe make, get a person that actually speaks naturally that is a voice actor from that country that you're trying to represent, right? Instead of having this like American person that you think sounds accurate, even though they probably don't. And I, I, I recommend this not just for the Spanish speaker in episode seven, but also for the di Japanese dialogue that happens early on in the movie between Mike and his father. They're Japanese, or at least his father is. He's half Japanese, it looks like. Uh, he doesn't come off as, uh, as like Japanese throughout the whole thing. He sounds pretty American. Um, but they do have Japanese dialogue and it sounds really, really, really freaking forced. Like it sounds like they don't speak Jap Japanese. They just made them memorize the phonetic pronunciation for these things for those little few lines. I would have preferred them to just have actors that can speak both. Like maybe McKenyu could have been a voice actor for this. I mean, it's not like uh, if he played Mike, it's not like he had a lot of lines because Mike is basically indisposed throughout the whole uh, series. But um, I really recommend that they do that because it, it comes off uh, much more authentic, but also it, it, it doesn't alienate the audiences that you're actually trying to bring in. Um, because like I said, episode seven was the best episode. But the dialogue was so bad that I considered stopping watching the show because of it. Um, but it's fine. It's not that big of a deal. If you're an American that doesn't know anything except English, you probably won't care. You probably won't notice. But if you're someone that knows a little bit of Spanish, kind of has some familiarity with it, you might find it to be off-putting or you might find it to be fine. I, I don't know. Your mileage may vary there. But for me, it was a very difficult thing to overcome. Uh, and it really tanked my enjoyment of the series a lot, like a lot. It really sucked out a lot of the fun that I was having with the series, even though like everything else about this episode was by far the best thing that we saw in the, the whole uh, thing. And then this kind of compounds into a worse issue with the last episode of the season, where we finally get the cool ass kaiju battle, Kong versus this Kraken thing. Um, but it ends really abruptly. like. Yes, the whole 20-ish minutes of the se of the last episode of the season finale are Kong versus the Stain fighting. But then the fight ends, and instead of getting a, another few minutes of resolution, which could have happened because streaming doesn't have to hold itself to uh, a specific time limit, they could have made the last finale 35 minutes or 27 minutes or 45 minutes, however long it needed to be. It doesn't have to be exactly the same as um, the other episodes in terms of length. Uh, and we could have had a much better resolution because they did this weird like jump cut thing where like, okay, everyone is a shitty position, jump cut to one of them being healed and kind of ignore everything and leave it at a very unsatisfying moment in the story. 
this isn't a good cliffhanger. This is not an enjoyable way of like, oh damn it, what's gonna happen? It's literally like, we didn't feel like finishing the story. So here you go, come back next season. And I don't think I will because I don't like how it ended. And I don't like how they fumbled the bag with, with certain things. Like it just doesn't feel great. Um, the animation is fine. The character creatures or the character design, the creature design is, is fun, it's good. I really like how Kong looks. But I didn't love all the characters. The voice acting wasn't the best. And even though episode seven was by far the best one, the dialogue was immensely, immensely, immensely cringy. And I think this is a me issue, but it still sucks because it tanks the enjoyment of this so, so much. And the abrupt ending that doesn't resolve anything is pretty shitty. I didn't like it. I felt pretty much robbed of my experience. Why did I sink two hours into the show if you're not gonna give me a good ending? You're gonna give me this shitty like uh, cut paste, uh, you know, come back next season type thing that I don't like. It doesn't feel satisfying at all. So yeah, that's my feelings and my opinions and my review of Skull Island. Let me know if you guys have watched it. If you haven't and you just watched this video, let me know how you, what you thought about it. Let me know if you had similar issues with uh, dialogue in this uh, series. If you speak any of the languages that they kind of incorporate. And uh, thank you guys so much for watching. See you guys later.